Yeah, me too. No kids at school this week, so. Oh, okay, shit. what's going on? Because I like blew they through would... all my usual <laughs> school zones this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're because of like COVID because they're, I guess, trying to make up for any. I, I don't know exactly what the reason is. It, it's COVID stuff, but they went to like a year round. So oh. we have two weeks off right now, and then in December we'll get two weeks off, and then in March we get two weeks off. Yeah, I was like, what's happening? Like, uh, do I work today? Why aren't the kids, <laughs> like, jamming up this fucking streets? Why am I able to go, like, a full 45 down yeah. red right now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I blew through all my usual school zones. <laughs> I did, I'm gonna lie. Hello everyone and welcome to Seriously Loco, the seriously crazy fan podcast for El Paso Locomotive FC, a proud member of the Beautiful Game Network and brought to you by Roughneck Scarves and Icarus FC. I'm Phil Baki, and uh, I am joined tonight by uh, my co-hosts. Uh, first, we got Christian Canales making his return to the pod. Christian, how you doing? I'm back again. It's <laughs> been a been a while since uh, my last pod, and even longer since my last uh, three person pod. I think last time it was just you and me. Mika couldn't make that one, so yeah, it's nice to have uh, almost the whole group back together. Yeah, we've uh yeah, we filled out the numbers a little bit for this one. Um always feels good. Although uh a lot to discuss, maybe not all positive on <laughs> on the Locos front, uh unfortunately, but um we're joined as well as Christian Alude by Mika Burrell. Mika, how's it going? It's going well. Yeah, it's nice to have the, the trio on tonight. This is like a throwback these days, but <laughs> I'm loving it. I uh I think there's there's no better way for Christian to announce his return than to start things off with Christian's question. We haven't had one in a while, Christian, but I <laughs> I hear you've got one for us tonight. I do. So it's it's October, it's officially spooky season, guys. So uh, this is either going to be a very boring question or a very controversial question. Um, well, okay, so it'll be a two-parter. So my first one is, where do you guys stand on candy corn? Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it is wax with sugar. That's how it tastes like to me. It's ugh, gross. So... I personally am not a candy corn fan, but I will say Erica, my wife, is a candy corn stan. Like <laughs> she loves candy corn and she would actually she she would defend it vehemently on the, on this podcast given the opportunity. And maybe maybe we'll need to provide that opportunity at some point, but <laughs> um no, she yeah, she loves it, but I yeah, I don't really I don't really get it. To be quite honest, I remember it being in a dish in my grandma's house and just staying away. <laughs> yeah. Is there like a C list candy that you ha- have like a guilty pleasure for? I'm talking like your your circus peanuts, your uh those little like berry wrap things that are at everyone's grandma's house, that kind of stuff. I don't know if this counts, but I feel like I never see people eating it, and I really like it. But I really like Rolos. Oh, that's, see, that's an, that's an old person candy to me. See, and they're really good. Like, so there you go. I guess it does count. I used to absolutely get down on some Werther's originals. There you go again. So that is I, another grandma's house candy, yeah. bro. I used to absolutely house Werther's originals. <laughs> I I have been known to partake in a in a role of Smarties every now and then. No, the, Smarties are the, classic. The way God meant them to be consumed, not like fifth grader crush them up and 
try and snort them is kind of our <laughs> take because, you know, we've all been there. Not that so, <laughs> back of the middle school toilet delinquent <laughs> behavior. Some of the best candy is like simulating drugs and alcohol, now that I think about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> Pixie sticks. Big League Chew. Big League Chew. Yeah. <laughs> What what else what else are there other deviant candies out there like <laughs> they have those lucky strike candies that are like uh, yeah those like bubblegum cigarette or yeah those like mm. chalk cigarettes yeah oh my god great That's, questions <laughs> i enjoy that i enjoy that one there are some like there are some truly like there are some candies that absolutely should not see the light of day that come to play around Halloween time. Like they just, yeah. they, they come out of the woodwork and I don't I, understand where people are finding them. I feel like there should be a lot of really entertaining feedback from this. So I really hope if you're listening to this episode, you know, once you get out of your car, you, uh, you send us a tweet, let us know, like I said, what's your, uh, what's your C list candy of choices. Your guilty pleasure candy that nobody else likes. That's I yeah I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of that question. That was that was that was good. Um, Very festive. Absolutely. And uh, well, as uh, before, we dive in to the meat of this episode, which we're gonna. Review El Paso Locomotives 1-1 draw at Widener Field against Colorado Springs switchbacks. And then we're going to look ahead to San Antonio FC. We're going to answer your listener questions. But before we dive into that, just a little bit of admin to get out of the way. Uh, We are seriously loco. And uh, if you enjoy El Paso Locomotive, you can find us on any anywhere you find your your podcasts or get your podcasts. Um, And uh, if you find us there, subscribe follow how whatever the platform allows um and uh and you can also find us on social media at seriously loco um find us there during matches and uh offering all kinds of of commentary and you can find our episodes posted there as well um so with that out of the way before we dive into this this result against switchbacks um locomotive had a couple of late moves in this usl transfer window before the roster freeze um and notably amongst them uh in terms of first team impact players we had cole turner join the team from uh philadelphia union and uh the young defensive midfielder seems like he was brought in as as depth for richie ryan and uh timely that he arrived when he did because uh it seems like Richie may be facing some time on the sidelines which we'll uh we'll get to that but Cole Turner he's now made two appearances for Locomotive and uh Mika we could start with you on this one but what did you what did you make of of this signing and and what have you made of Cole so far Yeah I mean I I've been one of the ones crying out on the pod for depth for Richie Ryan so I was happy to see that we had addressed that I think the hand was forced a little bit because of the injury of course Um, but I mean you know by all accounts Cole profiles very well he's he's very tall um, which I think we are a little slight sometimes in 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 the physical aspect of things so he adds that dimension Um, he has played at the base of a diamond for Philadelphia Union 2, which was, oh God, what were they called before? Bethlehem Steel at the time. Maybe maybe they were already Union 2 by then. But um, he has experience in that area of the park. And, you know, in his debut, he slotted in quite nicely. Now, I think there was a little bit of a different story uh, away to Colorado Springs, which we'll get on to. But, I mean, overall, it's definitely a common sense move. Uh, and, um, you know, one that also brings the average age of the squad down a bit. So I welcome that as well. And Christian, I mean, now that we've, now that we've seen, um, now that we've seen Cole in action, um, do you, do you think that he's, that he's going to fill that spot, that void left by Richie, um, effectively, or do you think 
we're going to see quite a bit of rotation with Yuma. What, what's your what's your sense for how we're going to utilize this kid? I mean, so the mod game, he, and, you know, it was, it was his first game, you know, he was just kind of you know, getting his legs under him out there. And then the switchbacks game was was rough forever. Um, so it, it it's, I don't think he did well, uh, particularly well, but then again, I don't think anyone uh, particularly on against switchbacks. So it's hard to say. I don't have a, a good uh, sample size yet, I would say, but I I think that going into the playoffs, I would like to have some more experience on the field. So I'm hoping it's more of a rotation thing. Um, and, and, you know, we, we see him, I don't know if sparingly is too harsh, but um, not the majority of the time is what I'll say. Sure. Not the only signing that we made though, um, in this, in this window and, uh, the other big signing that we, we brought in and I say big, uh, maybe a view towards the future, um, with this one, but locomotive also signed Brooklyn reigns, a, uh, Chicago native, um, who had been playing for the Barcelona residency Academy, uh, the same program that produced the prolific Diego Luna. Um, this, this signing Brooklyn, a, a little bit of a dynamic midfielder, maybe, maybe a free sort of eight. It seemed, um, what did you guys make of, of, uh, of this signing and has locomotive opened up a little bit of a pipeline here with the, with the Barca residency Academy in Arizona? Yeah, it was really exciting to see that we had gotten another player from Barca's residence academy, residency academy in Arizona. Brooklyn is, I mean, well known among you know the U.S. youth uh, league soccer circles, youth team soccer circles, if you will. Um, I posted that video of him hitting that bike, yes. <laughs> scoring two <laughs> goals uh, in, in over two games in his first uh, U.S. youth men, uh, national team. Uh, appearances and obviously that's where he really kind of <laughs> forced himself into the thoughts of many people you know uh looking for the next big thing in American fo- American soccer um yeah it's it's nice to see that we've kind of we have this connection now because i mean luna obviously has paid dividends for us so if brooklyn can be even half as impactful then then that's great. He's 16 years old. So um, I think we do have to temper expectations a little bit in that regard. But I mean, certainly looks like a very exciting player and has actually not only has he been part of Barca's residency academy, but he's actually trialed at La Masia um, with the likes of Matthew Hoppe and and, and players like that. So um, he's seen, you know, even if it wasn't a limited time and limited space, what a big European club looks like, although they're kind of shambles right now. But uh, <laughs> um, I will, I'd will. i hope that that means he's got big aspirations and, and by joining Locomotive, he'll, he'll try to, you know, treat, you know, not that we want to be a stepping zone club necessarily, but it'll be a good springboard for his, his future because he sees that, that he will get to play like Diego Luna has done. So he is in El Paso, but he has not yet uh, featured in a squad as far. I know he didn't, I know he wasn't in the squad at home. So, um, yeah, it'll just take a little bit of time to get him bedded in. And again, he's 16. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think technically when they announced this, the signing, they announced him as a signing for like the Academy side. Um, right. USL Academy. Yep. So, I mean, it, it'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how his development continues, but I think, I think as with Diego Luna, like we had, yeah, we tempered expectations pretty severely at the beginning of the season where we're saying, oh, yeah, like, we'll see what this kid can do, and, you know, and like maybe he'll get some minutes here and there. Um, obviously not the case. Like Diego Luna has become one of our best players um, and by his own talent, like by his own ability. Um, so the reality of the situation is that if Brooklyn like lives up, to some of the some of the talk around him and and some of the potential like he will absolutely feature for locomotive at some point not saying that he'll he'll do so this season necessarily um being brought in at 16 mid-season all of that but um 
you know, I would say that one, he certainly could be an impact player for locomotive going forward. And I think the second part of the Luna sign, like the knock on effect of the Luna signing is especially as we see like maybe where Diego goes from, from here, if we're seen not as a stepping stone, cause I know that can carry like a lot of negative connotations, but if we are seen as a viable route to like big things and, and a viable place to, launch a career from um then we could see a lot of moves like this and maybe the pipeline stays open in terms of these talented youngsters you know uh, making their their name in el paso and i think being associated with a club who or you know being associated as a club that gets results and develops young talent that's just about the best mix that you can get for a usl side so um so yeah, I, I I'm excited by the prospect of us, you know, having these sorts of long term relationships with good youth programs where these players can make an impact in our first team and and maybe go on to to bigger and better things um, with them being being so young. But um, but yeah, I think it's an exciting an exciting move and maybe a a another step in a fruitful relationship with the with with. <laughs> Barca's residency academy. Um, but the optimism, the hope, the look towards the future is, is all well and good, but we have football to talk about right now. Colorado Springs one El Paso locomotive one in Colorado Springs. Um, first and foremost, I want to get just the raw reaction. So Christian, we'll start with you. Um, one, one coming out of Widener field, like probably a result that we, we would have been fine with going into the game, but a little bit strange in the way that it actually played out. What was your, what was your reaction to the, to this result? You know, this season has been a season where, I mean, going into every game, I am expect you know the three points um cuz I mean we're fully capable of of getting a win against every team on our schedule um not that they're all you know of equal difficulty of course uh and this was would be of course one of the harder matches uh strangely you know something that I don't think any of us would have predicted at the beginning of the season um but um like you said Going at you know after just ten minutes in this match, uh, you know I was ready to to be very happy with a nil nil draw because um, out of the gates we were slow and like I, I said when we were watching on Saturday we just looked like children out there playing against grown men we could not keep the ball um, you know we we could barely get the ball much less keep it. Uh, so it, it was a really, really ugly match. Um, and we were lucky to get the opportunity to get, to take home the three points. We were very lucky with that. And then, you know, we, you know, the, the run of play kind of evened out. Cause I think that Colorado was even more unlucky to only go away with one point, uh, from this match. Cause they, they played us off the field. Mika, is that is that where this, like, despite the the draw away from home, normally we'd be fine with it. Is is it all just out of how uncharacteristic or like how unlocomotive this match felt? Yeah, I, I I can't really put my finger necessarily on on what it was. I certainly don't disagree with anything Christian said there. Um, but this felt like the first time all season, which I, I suppose we're a little bit spoiled to be saying this in October, but it felt like the first time that we were thoroughly outplayed. <laughs> yeah. um, every duel was not going our way, every 50-50. Uh, physically, we were really no match for, for Colorado Springs and a lot of their really you know quite pacey players. Um, Haji Berry, you could tell, was fired up, really wanted another one, wanted to equal the scoring record in USL Championship. Um, 
we were lucky enough to, to deny him of that at least. But uh, yeah, it was just not a poor, uh, not a good showing. Um, and you know, I've I've praised Mark Lowry's side in the past in that when we've rotated, it's very much felt like plug and play where everyone knows the system, and and so rotation is not going to be so damning. But it didn't feel like that on this one. We rotated heavily, and it really felt like we were playing a B team. Uh, and that's no disrespect to the guys that were on the field. It's just, I think it was, it's not them. I think it was an off, you know, a bad day at the office, if you will. And I'm sure we'll get into the lineup, but I think that, that the lineup in the system had a lot to do with it, to be fair. Well, and I mean, we can go ahead and, and just launch into that. I think, you know, you have, have brought up a few times recently about the system, about, Hey, let's get back to basics. And in this match, it was a pure four four two. It looked like um, the the initial like the way that we came out. Logan and goal, obviously, but Eder, Boehner, Meshach, Maka across the back four. So no surprises there. But then a flat midfield four, as we've seen more recently from Mark Diego out on the left. And it was Josue actually out on the right. It was uh, Gomez out on the right. A two in midfield of Chapa and and Turner. And then Zacharias and, <laughs> and Lucho up top, which was totally a different look. One, because we've only really seen Zacharias it, like deployed in a right back or like a right wing role. Um and uh, so you've spoken a lot recently, Mika, about the about the four four two and the fact that the flat four four two just seems like it's not really like getting the most out of the players that we that we have. And in this one in particular, to rotate so heavily and then on top of that play a system that relied so much on the individuals in those positions, like it, it really felt jarring in how just ineffective it was. Yeah. I, this was a, just another example for me personally of the four, four, two flat, just really not working. And I think you're exactly right. When you combine that with the amount of rotation that we did, it just really didn't, cast any of those midfielders in a good light. I think I think putting a a new man in Cole Turner next to a depth player, to be fair, in Chapa Herrera was a call. <laughs> yeah. Um I don't know that that worked out uh because you know as we know Chapa likes to graft and and, and press and, and run around and so you know in doing that he leaves that midfield posi- position a lot and it really just left us very skint in midfield uh it felt Mm -hmm. like Cole Turner was on an island by himself a lot of the time and um he's still just you know coming to grips with joining locomotive and and learning how we play and and learning his you know about his new teammates getting to know people and so I just felt that that was um not an ideal situation for him whereas you know when we have a midfield three you know in the diamond one, we have that extra body, so that's just more space that, you know, we get to take up and hopefully get gain numerical advantages against our opposition. Um, but two, I think it does emphasize midfielders' strengths and hide their weaknesses because there's more support. We just didn't have that on the night against Colorado Springs, and so I just thought that that, that pivot did not work in any way, um, and I really would be shocked to see it again. I mean, I know a lot of these changes were enforced by injury and, and the fixture list and the congestion, but uh, it, it wasn't good. And Christian, you mentioned like Colorado Springs being, being unlucky in this one. And uh, the, especially in the first half, Colorado Springs with a few early chances. Um, they got in behind good ball across the face of goal. Haji Berry played a couple of really good crosses into the box and Colorado Springs unable to generate even shots off of what could have been tap ins on a, on a different day. Um, and so <laughs> locomotive come away actually looking like a little 
flattered in the expected goals column because Colorado Springs finishing or ability to get on the end of that of that final pass was just not really there in the first half. And that led to like locomotives luck over the 90 minutes uh, was was really more so about Colorado Springs not being able to to finish their chances and less about anything that locomotive was doing. Yeah, it was like a really shocking role reversal. I think we've seen a lot of matches where we felt uh, probably the way that Colorado felt a lot of this match where, um, you know, we feel like we should end the game with five or six goals. Um, but, the, you know, that that uh, final touch is, is just lacking. So we end up going home with, you know, zero or one. So, uh, you know, it's it was kind of a... This game was very karmic in a lot of ways, I'll say. Um, <laughs> you know, it, in that Colorado should have probably had a lot of goals... And then the fact that we end up losing, you know, at the death, um, which we've unfortunately has happened to us a, a handful of times this season. But we've also been on it where that's how we end up, you know, taking home a point. The uh, very full circle here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like it, it, it really did. <laughs> it really did feel like the opposite of a couple of games like it felt like the opposite of a lot of things for locomotive in that um, our inability to get on the ball, like Colorado Springs out possesses us out passes us. And I, I can say for almost, almost certain that this has got to be one of one of very few games in locomotives history that they've created or that they've completed less passes than their opposition. Um, that is like one of the few things that you could, you can almost bank on. Um, and, uh, in this one, they're out past and, um, the XG for, for the match, depending on the source that you go to, um, I think there were some that were listing Colorado Springs, like just shy of two, um, with, with locomotive just above one, they're the USL's uh, source that they use had Colorado Springs at a 1.12 or something like that because they weren't generating shots or actually a 1.06 because they weren't actually generating any shots. Like even the Boehner chance, which would have been like a huge chance if it's Haji Berry taking the shot ends up not being XG because it's, it's an own goal. And then, um, yeah, so it just shows how XG one can totally fluctuate depending on the source, but also like it can be completely misleading because expected goals without not taking shots into account, but just taking like chances into account would have been off the charts for Colorado Springs because there are multiple times they were, you know, inside the six yard box with a chance to, to tap in and um, couldn't get on the end of the cross or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, like as you guys are saying, it's just, it's such a weird game because one, we were genuinely outplayed for the entirety of the 90 minutes, which I don't think a team and I'm including like, I'm including games from last season. Like I'll include the Phoenix Western conference final. Like they, I don't know that there's a game that I can think, think about over the last like couple of seasons where we've been genuinely outplayed from start to finish. Um, and I haven't at all felt like hard done by, by the result. Like there are, there are plenty of, of instances, as you said, Christian, where it's just been like, ah, uh, like, we should have, you know, if our finishing was a little bit better or if we were a little bit sharper, this, this game, it was 100%. Like we were absolutely lucky to get out of Widener field with a point. And the fact that we were in a position to almost snatch all three would have been straight up. I mean, it would have been highway robbery, like of the highest order. If we had made it out of there with three points, um, the good trend as has been pointed out though, is locomotive do put themselves just a few minutes from time in a position to escape with all three points. Leandro Carrijo scores another late goal and the impact subs um, in recent matches 
have been making a big impact. Um, we talk, we've talked about the, the Rebillon substitution a couple of games ago, totally changing, totally changing, uh, the match against, uh, crap. Who was that? Bold. I think bold. Yeah. So lots, lots of good subs and, uh, Carijo comes on and, and nearly wins it for locomotive with, uh, popping up at the right place at the right time. Yeah, it's uh, something has definitely changed in, a, in the way that we use our subs because used to be that we would wait way too long to make them. But now it seems Mark's found a, a sweet spot, if you will, where he's, he's willing to change it. And in fact, he I think he makes two changes here, like just like right on the hour mark. So, um, yeah, pleased for Leandro that he was able to contribute. I think there is a, a little bit of a worrying stat in that it, this season he's only – Anytime he scored, we've only won once. But, I mean, that might just be an anomaly. It might be just the game state that he finds himself scoring <laughs> these goals and trying to, to rescue us. But, yeah, I think that was, you know, c- totally against the run of play. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, we thought maybe we could escape uh, with something, but it wasn't to be. Um, I do like, though, that he is contributing and that the subs in general are, are coming on and, and trying to do a job for the side. Christian, I mean, I I would be remiss if I didn't give you a chance to comment on a Carijo goal. You are you you are the the man's number one fan, I think. <laughs> At least on the podcast, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it was exactly the kind of goal that that you expect from him at this point. Um, you know exactly what we thought he was here to do and that's just like you said just be in the right place at the right time use that you know those like decades of experience now to to just have a feel and 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 just act instinctively to uh put yourself in those positions so it was uh you know nothing special it it was really like it wasn't even a particularly like like difficult finish either you know just really was just there and scooped the ball into the net. So, um, you know, more power to every, more power to him. Every time he, he scores, I think, um, I feel a little more, uh, validated. Um, (laughs) cause I know that sometimes, um, it, it can be a little bit frustrating watching him on the field, understandably. So, um, cause it does feel like sometimes he, he doesn't have too much to contribute, but, you know he's he's there when when we've needed him to be. I don't think um, he's ever had a goal that wasn't significant. He either you know has either given us you know got us equal or put us ahead. Uh, so you know he he has that that ability that that uh, je ne sais quoi. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's true though because you know for all the for all the the times that I think we we've talked where it's like, oh, well, you know, he can offer like half an hour here or 45 minutes here type thing. The at the end of the day, like for a guy to score goals like that and it seems like, oh, he scores these like he's always close in and he's always it's always like tap ins and all that stuff. Being in those positions is a skill in and of itself, like getting into those, those areas and making those runs and identifying that space. Like it absolutely, he is drawing on that experience and that, that just innate ability to sense, like, where is this chance going to fall? Um, and the, the locomotive goal comes from like old school, whatever, like, I don't know. I just picture like Sam Allardyce screaming, like put it in the mixer or whatever, like, (laughs) And and that's just what it was. Like we got the ball into the box for once in this match. Like we, we just like pump it in, uh, from across and it falls, it falls to Carijo kindly. Um, and he makes no mistake. And that's like, there are, there are times where I think good teams will point to a a match like this and say like, Hey, this is the type of game that you need to see out and you're not always going to be at a hundred percent. And 
you know, good teams like find ways in, in games like this. I don't think it's really a case of that because good teams also aren't just like totally battered for 90 minutes. Um, (laughs) But the reality is we do have these, we do have these, these, uh, you know, these players who one absolutely never say die. Like they will continue to fight despite the fact that it it hasn't been good. Um, And (laughs) like, that continued belief in this, in this case led to, you know, despite it maybe relying a lot on luck and relying a lot on, on Colorado Springs, not executing to their fullest. um, We do put ourselves in a position to win this game, regardless of the fact that we were just absolutely dire for, for the better part of it. Um, And so maybe, I don't know, maybe it is a sign of a a good team in the, in the resilience to fight back or to, to show some fight there. Um, I think a, I don't think it should have been as maybe lopsided as it ended up being um, towards Colorado Springs, but um, the, the challenge afterwards is locomotive have, about 11 minutes to see out. Cause I think the goal comes in the 83rd. There ends up being four minutes of stoppage time and a couple minutes into stoppage time. We see what has become a little bit of a recent trend pop up again, which is locomotive concede a late free kick um, just outside of the area and questionable whether it needed to be, to be conceded, like whether it was a necessary foul or not and, and not for the first time. So, um, we got a question in this, in this worrying trend from at HJ, the third, what do you make of us surrendering, surrendering these very late goals and ending up with draws, um, with this now being the third match in, in recent memory, San Antonio, Austin bold, and now switchbacks who have either equalized or, beat us with a, a late goal. Um, so what do you guys make of this, this trend of us being on the receiving end of these late goals rather than, uh, handing them out ourselves? Yeah. I mean, clearly as, as anyone knows, I think (laughs) it is a skill to manage the game. Right. And, um, in this instant, at first, I kind of rationalized it to myself that we didn't really have a lot of our normal leaders on the pitch to kind of, you know, tell people stay focused and this, that, and the third. But against Austin Bold, we had our our strong starting eleven and did the same thing. Yeah. So I, having thought of that, I don't know that I can necessarily blame it on personnel, but I mean, clearly there's something that's not getting across from the the manager or, or the staff because you have to get it into these guys' heads to, to, to close this thing out and, and manage matches much better than we have been. Um, all of these have come on the road. So, I mean, the crowd's against you. I get that. The conditions are not what you're used to, but, you know, three seasons in with this club, I, I do expect better because, I mean... Uh, a lot we do have a lot of uh, the same core of of guys and um you know we've been pretty stable overall so i i really don't understand why this is now a thing um it's it's very it's really unfortunate it's really frustrating i'm sure it's frustrating for the players too um having grafted all that time really especially in this one against colorado springs just being run ragged and finally you get you get a a bit of hope with the Cuddy Hogle and to just squander it like that is, is just silly. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what needs to change, but something in the messaging I think is not getting across because we're doing this wh- who, you know, regardless of who's on the pitch. And yeah, Christian, it, it, this means no away wins since July now. Um, and, and a few in the, in a row, um, what do you, what do you make of this of this trend of us conceding late on the road? Yeah, I am going to say something that might be a little bit uh, you know it, it might touch a few nerves because it's not a it's not a criticism that we make often on this show, but at this point, you know, in the season, 
Uh, you know, we went through September with, you know, two wins and three draws. Um, and then this first one in October. So this point in the season is not when you want this to be happening. Um, especially when you were in the and we were uh, basically be since before San Antonio after that San Antonio loss um, things have seemed to be going a little bit downhill we were before that San Antonio match we were at a point where we we're very much it was very much a possibility to uh, take home I don't know I don't know what the trophy is called for you know when you have the best league I know there's a shield or a cup or something um, but having that best record in the league and it's not a, something that's impossible at this point, but if that was the end goal, we've certainly uh, put ourselves in a position where it's been made that much more difficult. And as a fan, for that to be for this to be happening again, because I think this happened year one also, um, is we get to this last part of the season and we start kind of falling off a little bit, uh, and it's it's frustrating because. We want to be those giants in the USL, you know, the the Louisville, the Phoenix. Um, but as rough a season as Phoenix has had, it's grind time right now. And they want that home field advantage in the playoffs. And if you ask me, they're going to get it. Um, I, it's It's frustrating, but I think that we are not mentally, it doesn't look like we're in a position to dominate this this end of the season and we're fortunate that we did as well as we did in the beginning where our top of the table position is not necessarily threatened at this point secure we definitely haven't clinched yet but um you know we can be a little bit comfortable but that being said i don't think the team do feel comfortable with where we're at right now and um i backtracked a little bit from where I started with this and that I think that like Mika said this doesn't seem to be a you know a player issue um something not thing has some questions have to be asked of Mark and the staff um not saying he's on the hot seat by any means of course um but at this point something is going on that needs to be addressed within that coaching staff because the players uh, no matter who's on the field, no matter what common players, no matter what kind of tactics are getting thrown out there, it's barely being enough right now uh, for, from where I sit. So so I think that some of that accountability really needs to start falling on them and they need to, to figure something out. I think, I think there's something to the, that San Antonio goal and not to, not to put too much like importance on, that particular match or anything like that, but the fragility in the late stages from locomotive is not something that we've traditionally seen. And that Dylan goal for whatever reason, like rather than being a blip has now turned into a trend, like whether it's something that is, is just bad luck or, you know, a bad, a bad few moments or something like that we can unfortunately point to this moment away at San Antonio where the script like slightly shifted because just the week prior was the Boehner equalizer in Albuquerque, which was, it felt like this, this continuation of, Oh, locomotive is the one who always finds a way locomotive is the one who like never gives up, never say die. And I'm not saying that's not true, but since then, we've had Dylan, the Dylan winner in San Antonio, the um, the bold equalizer from Guadarrama, and now the equalizer, the Boehner own goal in in Colorado Springs. So it's just there's this yeah this fragility that's like come out in these late stages, and yeah, you can point to each one and say like ah oh, there's a bit of bad luck, and there's a but like it's the second time in a row that the goal comes from a free kick on the right side, like on the right side of locomotives defense, just outside the box in a super dangerous area where, you know, a deliver any delivery in is going to be difficult to deal with. And, and all of these things like 
<laughs> and ironically, I guess the Dylan goal comes from a unwillingness to foul him like as he approached the area. So I don't know. Maybe we learned the lesson too hard and where we're now just fouling right outside the box. But um, but yeah, that like whether it's down to a certain like to certain players or to to the, just there there seems to be this little bit of fear that has like crept in in those late stages when we're trying to see games out on the road. And the fact that we haven't been able to, when especially like early on, we did grind out of like, there were a few results where we probably deserved to like draw, or I think we've collected like 11 more points than we should have up to this point in the season, which like based on XG and, and all of these things, which you can take it with a grain of salt. But the bottom line is like, we were grinding out results and we were finding a way. And now like we've actually found a way to, to drop points um, recently. And um, yeah, it's just a little, it's a little disheartening, especially given the fact that one, we were in a position to snag home field and Phoenix recently left the door open for us to catch them um, for home field in the West. And the second part of it being the fact that, the playoffs are single elimination. And I know we've historically performed very well, but this sort of thing can be absolutely fatal in the playoffs. Like if it's allowed to continue. So there's just gotta be some, yeah, there's gotta be some reversal here because if, if these late goals continue to be a thing, especially on the road, um, yeah, it, not only w- will we not be playing <laughs> with home field advantage in the playoffs, but we, we may be trying to defend a lead in the playoffs on the road somewhere. And uh, and hopefully we uh, hopefully we're able to do so. But yeah, it's a it's a weird spot because we just haven't seen this sort of this sort of thing from locomotive since I mean, really, since the very beginnings of season one. Yeah, and one thing I will say, too, about the no away win since late July, I think I might have made this this point on the last pod, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but that was okay to do in season one, maybe even in season two as well, where it's like, just don't lose away. But the club themselves have come out and said they want to win trophies. Well, you do have to find a way to win on the road, or at least not beat yourself at the last minute or give give up any kind of advantage however unfair it is because there are championship teams that typically get results they don't deserve and we should have hung on to that cutty ho goal that was totally against the run of play yeah um so yeah just not good enough lately and let's not you know let to not lose perspective you know this is a team that has still only lost twice this year but true um you know the the draws are Killer, just like you said, in, in a lot of seasons, the draws are, are will be what saves you. Um, but they're really shooting us in the foot at this point. And I think it's not that we're I don't think we're upset because we think the team is is shit right now. Yeah, <laughs> we're upset because we have these high expectations that the team has has led us to have, um, you know, they they have that that first season, you know, shocker. Expansion team, you know, makes it to the conference finals. Great. Second season, you know, we did great. Take it with a grain of salt because it is, you know, that COVID-affected season. But we still did it. We got to where, you know, we got to the same spot and just a little bit further because we went to penalties. And, you know, the team comes out in this third season with this swagger and, and not that there's anything wrong with it. I quite enjoy it. But... You can't do this. You can't be season one, season two locomotive if you're t- if you come out of the gates wanting to be, you know, USL uh, Titans locomotive. It, it's it's the it's the dissonance that that is frustrating for me is we have mm. this talk and beginning of the season. Fantastic. But just lately, it, it seems like it's going downhill. And I think we just get a little worried and anxious because we've, we've heard this before already and and I I don't want to go through it again. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly don't want to, don't want to like blow what we're saying out of proportion into, uh, in, into like massive criticism of the team or saying that we're shit now, but, um, it's not enough to be like in the position that we're in. It's not enough to be good. 
it like, you know, two losses would be fine, but the nine draws, like that's where like turning just a handful of those into wins. Um, and you're talking about the difference between, you know, a Western conference final being played in El Paso or, you know, even the USL final being played in El Paso. Um, and not, and, and, you know, potentially having to go to a Phoenix or having to face, you know, a higher seated team out of the Pacific or, or whatever. Um, and, and the reality is that locomotive are a hundred percent still in control of their destiny, but that grip gets looser each of these results that, pa- that come to pass. And as each performance like passes, we just hope that we're going to arrest that, that form and hope that we're going to to turn things around and all it may take is, you know, one result or one performance to maybe shake the team out of it. But at the moment on the road, like locomotive look a pretty vulnerable prospect where previously, you know, they were extremely tough to beat. Um, We looked extremely beatable (laughs) in Colorado Springs and that's where, we just hope that we can improve, but we've got San Antonio FC up next. Uh, so we'll take a quick break and then we'll be back to preview San Antonio and answer your questions. Welcome back to seriously loco. Mika San Antonio FC up next and all of what we described aside locomotive are back at home. It's a Wednesday night uh, as we're going to face <laughs> every Wednesday night at the swap. Um, whatever it's uh, the, our fate for the rest of the season is to play these midweek games at home. Um, but we've got so San strange. Antonio and aside from the form and wanting to get back to winning ways, we also have the small matter of the Copa Tejas and, and locomotive can clinch it with a win um, or a draw, I think, against San Antonio. Yeah, uh, like we tried to tell ourselves and and tried to cope, you know, that's why we (laughs) allowed the equalizer in Austin so we could celebrate it at home with the fans. Um, Yeah, it's going to be a big occasion. I definitely encourage anyone listening to this to to make it out to Southwest University Park and stay tuned to Seriously Loco's Twitter because we will have tickets available for the match. Yes. So... So keep your eyes on that. Um, but yeah, this is a huge, huge occasion for the club. Um, our chance to get our hands on our very first piece of silverware. And, you know, it's a fan, fan-owned fan trophy, fan-sponsored trophy, but it means a lot to the fans. And to be the best in Texas is certainly a, an honor that, that we'll be happy to, to, to have. Um, the Copa Tejas will be in the building. We can't confirm. Um, and there will, I think be an opportunity for fans to take pictures with the trophy. So like, it's going to be a whole thing guys. I mean, it's going to be a real party. (laughs) And I, I do think I do rate our chances of, of finally clinching and, and, and winning Copa de at home. Granted San Antonio FC have been quite good recently in their past five games, only one loss to New Mexico United. Um, but really good, uh, form otherwise, uh, very stingy defense. They've only allowed like two goals. Um, no. Yeah. Two, two goals in five matches. Um, so, you know, it's going to be really a a tactical battle. Um, and we've seen previously that San Antonio has given us fits just this season. So, uh, it's very even matchup, um, in the recent past. And I'm, I'm personally looking forward to it because the swap is, it is our refuge as much as it is a, a fortress as well. It's also our, our refuge. And uh, yeah, um, I'm hoping we just bounce back from what was really a lackluster performance up in Colorado Springs. Obviously um, not only, not only a chance to win Copa Tejas um, and, and claim some silverware, but Christian also an opportunity uh, with a win to clinch their spot in the playoffs. And, uh, and, and not that that's, you know, not that we're totally wrapped around the axle about whether or not we'll qualify for the, for the playoffs because we have a, a pretty sizable lead there, but the um, peace of mind uh, that some of these teams are experiencing Phoenix in Louisville in 
um, as a division leader locomotive, just looking to punch their ticket um, and kind of kind of put this any sort of of uh, concerns around being caught or some catastrophe happening out of out of the mind. No, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that when you're in, again, I feel may, maybe we're being dramatic about the state that the team is in right now, but I, I'm going to say when you're in a bit of a rut, I think that those small accomplishments, um, you know, just, just those boxes that you're checking off, like some maybe like if you're a list person, you know, <laughs> you, you have lists for everything and, and just the satisfaction of checking that box off is just what you need to um just divert that attention and energy towards the next goal. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's, you know, if we can kill two birds with one stone and just, you know, finish the Copa Tejas conversation and the, you know, playoffs, you know, making the playoffs conversation the night, it'll be great. And I think that it's, it can be very uh, poetic, I think, for the to be able to have a good solid game uh, against San Antonio because as we were saying, you know, just a few minutes ago, this this kind of slump that we've uh, come to find ourselves in uh, could be attributed to that last second loss against San Antonio. So if we're able to kind of get this divination and revival against the same team, I think that there's a, you know, there's a little bit of a storyline to that as well. That would be entertaining for fans and, uh, you know, depending on what kind of player you are, if you read into that kind of stuff. San Antonio, uh, having started extremely slow, as, as we know, um, find themselves in third. And they have opened up a little bit of a gap, despite their recent loss to New Mexico United. They have a little bit of a gap, maybe, maybe a chance to, uh, for them, are, you know, they're seeing it to make themselves, their playoff picture a little bit, a little bit more secure. Um, they since that one nil loss to New Mexico, Chris Weehan scored that late goal for for New Mexico to get to get the win um, in San Antonio. But San Antonio last time out went away to Oklahoma City Energy and got a one nil win courtesy of a Marcus Epps goal. Um, San Antonio's form, Mika, since since our last game has you know been better. Than, than at the start of the season, but certainly not like blowing anybody away. What do you, what do you make of San Antonio coming into this one? Um, decent form, but you know, do we, do we think that San Antonio will be able to break their recent issues uh, when they come to the swap or, or do you think locomotive are going to be able to assert themselves? Yeah, I mean, given the the starting lineup that we fielded against Colorado Springs, I'm expecting that our our lineup for this match will be a lot stronger. Um, and you know, couple that with being at home, I do think we'll be able to assert ourselves a little bit more and um, try to control the game and try to to, to put it away early if we can um, and, and get that trophy. Um, yeah, and the th- the thing with San Antonio too that I you know I compliment them on their defense and and not allowing a lot of goals, but they're not really scoring like boatloads either. So I think that kind of plays into our favor, and we can manage that. Um, they've been playing a lot uh, more spread out, so they have that kind of um, advantage, if you will, because their past three games have they've had a week in between. Whereas yeah. we've kind of been really just grinding it out. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we joke on here that it's probably better for us. But uh, they do have the benefit of a little bit of rest. Um, but, you know, for this one, they'll have just played on Sunday as well. So um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But I, I do rate us for this one. Well, uh, we have to we have to make predictions. We got to get back in the in the pick them in the pick'em lane. So Christian, uh, do you want to, to start off our, uh, our, our pick'em segment? Yeah, let's do it. Um, it's been a while to recap, uh, but it looks like not too much has maybe changed as far as the standings go. Everyone scored a few points since, since we last talked about it. Um, Austin, um, through, through virtue of of um, missing a few picks and and just uh, poor form compared to last season, finds himself at the bottom of the table with eleven. 
uh, just 11 points through three four matches. So um, very difficult season for him. Um, Mika finds herself in third with 15. Um, not impossible to catch up, but um, uh, still a, Phil has opened up a nice little gap for himself. Phil's got 19 uh, in second place. Um, and I have uh, maintained my status at the top with 25. Uh, so six points between Jesus. first and second, uh, <laughs> four points between uh, third and second, and four points between third. So uh, not impossible for anyone to, to to move to any position of the table at this point, but um, I found my form compared to last year. I did really poorly last year. I seem to be doing much better this time around. I'm still salty about the Austin Bold equalizer denying <laughs> me a perfect score. We, sh- I, yeah, we should say you, you had a 2-1 uh, Diego goal prediction, which, which would have been right on the money. I, I'm, still, I'm still mad about it. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Because that would have taken me up to, what, like 20... Two or 23. Three more. 22? 22. Yeah. And would have put me in striking distance. And, uh, yeah, Sonny Guadarrama not only denying Locomotive the three, the three points, but denying me three points as well. <laughs> so <laughs> It's personal. <laughs> in the fucking testimonial or whatever. Yeah, just... <laughs> Ain't no way. Ain't no fucking way. So... <laughs> I've been waiting. I've been waiting for an excuse anyways. <laughs> um, so, well, with that being said, I guess Mika would be, would you be the first to uh, make your picks for the San Antonio match? The yeah. potential playoff and Copa Tejas clincher. Yeah. So I, again, I, I do think we will win. Um, I just, for some reason, I, I rate us to, to bounce back. Um, I'm going to go 2-1, though. Uh, y'all know I've been, like, hating on us with getting clean sheets and stuff, so I'm going to keep that going. You haven't been, um, ro- you haven't been wrong in that department, like, <laughs> to yeah. be fair. Yeah, I'm going to go 2-1, and I will have Lucho getting a cheeky goal against his former side. He does love a goal against... Yeah. Yeah. And to and to win a trophy. Yeah. I like it. I um so I do I do actually think we stand a good chance to keep a clean sheet at home. Um I I I'm gonna go for a two nil. Um bouncing back with a nice little clean sheet and we're talking, you know, talking classic Classic loco, like maybe a goal, like in like the sixty fifth, and then <laughs> you know ninety plus two, like icing it. Um, just old school swap performance. Nothing in the first half, and then two in the second. Um, I I will say. And maybe this is so the one player who I actually meant to like give more credit after, after this, this last game um, in, uh, in Colorado Springs, who I will pick as my way of showing appreciation for his performance um, was Josue Aron Gomez. Um, I thought that of, of the players like who were, like a lot of our attackers were super marginalized. And I think we talked about obviously some of the challenges of the system to me, Gomez was the only one who, when the ball went out to him to relieve pressure or to maintain possession or anything, he was the only one that the ball was sticking to. Um, And that's with some, you know, absolutely brilliant controllers of the ball. Um, The, uh, Basically, like, Gomez was the only one that could relieve any sort of pressure or was, or was like, able to 
I don't know, basically like get us out of trouble at all. And I know it's his substitution that ultimately leads to the goal because Carrijo comes on. But I do think Gomez may be playing in the old system. I think he gets some good chances and, and puts one away. I think he's in decent form um, on, on that front. So I'll say Gomez 2-0. Okay. I, like I said, I think, we, I think um, a mirroring of our last encounter with San Antonio is is uh, in the cards here. So I'm going to go with a 2-1, a locomotive win. Um, my heart wants to say, because of that same storyline that I'm looking for, that Velasquez will score because he uh, was the lone goal scorer uh, last time around. Uh, but being that he was not selected in Colorado... Um, feel maybe there's something there. Um, maybe we won't see him tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? No, on Wednesday. Uh, maybe we won't see him on Wednesday, so I'm going to be forced to say probably Diego. I'm going to say 2-1 with a Diego goal. All right. Well, there you have it. And we're into, you know, locomotives in, in the home stretch, but so are we in the pick'em. And now I'm, I'm, I'm really... I'm trying to make up some ground here. Try to try to make this interesting. <laughs> um, I think if we were on a Colorado Springs uh, broadcast, we would. I would say that I was also a heavyweight of the Pickham. <laughs> Two Pickham heavyweights going at it, Christian with a sizable lead, but never mind that. um anyway (laughs) that's that's neither here nor there um so that is uh looking ahead to san antonio i'm i'm excited for for this one it should be should be a great match it it san antonio's been provided some some uh exciting ones this season so i'm i'm sure it will be the same um on wednesday but Without further ado, guys, we've got a, a handful of listener questions, despite us sending the prompt out quite, quite late. Um, and, and thank you to everybody who sent in questions um, and for following along. We actually, the first question in, and this is fitting because uh, at Ramen Call, a.k.a. Harry uh, on Twitter, um, San Antonio FC fan, he's, he's trying to get the scoop. He's trying to get the intel. Um, for SAFC, he asks, how's the health of, of Locomotive? Yuma's been out recently, and is that more for roster rotation, um, or or is he hurt? Um, we actually have a little bit more of a an in-depth, I guess, uh, look at, at Locomotive's injury report these days. And Mika, you had uh, you had a little bit of a uh, an overview from the club, and then I know we have some of our own uh ideas or thoughts around around some of the injuries yeah well i mean first of all yuma is definitely not out for roster rotation uh he is one of the first names on the team sheet for mark lowry (laughs) so no i I think he's just taking that growing strain easy i think he was in the squad uh for colorado springs yeah um, he was on the bench yeah unused substitute so we might see him back in place of boehner um well, uh, no, 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 alongside Meshack. Uh, but yeah, the health of El Paso is, is uh, you know, controversial lately, let's say. Um, <laughs> you know, we, you know, shout out to our comms guy, Derek, who who puts together a lot of really great information for the media and sends it out. Um, you know, what what we understand is Richie Ryan, of course, still suffering that, that injury, probably won't be back at any point this month. Um or, you know, soon at least. Yeah. Um, just because that, that did seem like a pretty robust uh, injury on him. Fox is, is you know, I think it's safe to say he's a little bit injury prone, and so he's kind of day-to-day. Um, he was also on the bench in Colorado Springs, but, again, notably, like, unused. Um, right. And didn't start, so... Yeah. Yeah. I think you I think he he might do cuz I think he's probably ahead of of Bainer in the pecking order at least in that that's center center of the park. Mm-hmm. Um or center of the defense. Um I guess Seba Velasquez has also picked up a bit, a bit of a knock. Don't know too much about that, but um Yeah. 
certainly hope he can come back for San Antonio because he does love a game against San Antonio. <laughs> um, and and Mares, Dylan Mares has been not- noticeably absent um, in recent fixtures. Uh, don't know if there's something going on behind the scenes or if it's just a knock as well. But I mean, it's that time of the year where the fixtures are coming thick and fast and guys are getting hurt. And uh, yeah, and um, I, I blame USL referees. <laughs> for not protecting the players no i blame um, usl for this stupid schedule and the schedule is absolutely brutal yeah, yeah stop me. making me go downtown on a wednesday and i'm sick of it <laughs> <laughs> at jake edwards you don't know what it's like because <laughs> i'm too like tired after work so i end up grabbing an uber not even because i'm gonna like drink or anything i'm just tired like i don't want to drive so i end up spending 20 dollars to go downtown it's like yeah bruh been the, but been that's the... neither here nor there so <laughs> yeah that's that's the injury report there you go you've got your scouting um the the we do understand that the club is pretty like guarded with this information because they do like care if other teams know but yeah. uh it's what we're here for so the uh, the other question we had about fitness um, from Locomotive was actually from, and I have to I have to give AJ a shout out here. He is now <laughs> okay. So some of you will remember from a few episodes ago, AJ asked a question under his old at, which was AJ followed by a bunch of numbers. Um, AJ's at now is at AJ's not a bot. <laughs> Real ones, no. Real ones know that I, and I apologize, AJ, for questioning whether you were a bot or not. Um, due I think to all it the was numbers, me. And, I think I was like, oh, I hope that's not a Russian bot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so our apologies, but um, it's a dough bat. I love it. And I think we've now successfully had two. <laughs> I think we've actually convinced two Twitter users now via this podcast to change their, <laughs> to change their <laughs> ads. Uh, because key bullying. <laughs> 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 so we're just going to continue that. But at, uh, at AJ's not a bot asked. Uh, so do we think Yuma is going to be a hundred percent for the playoffs or is that why they brought this guy in from Philly? Um, I mean, AJ, for me, I think I think it seems like the sense I'm getting from the club is that Yuma is is getting closer to full fitness and probably will be back prior to the playoffs. I think the Cole, I think the Cole Turner signing was far more about Richie Ryan um, than it was about Yuma. And I think Richie is the more concerning of the two. Like, I think Richie is likely like at best we see him in the playoffs um, is the sense that, that we got anyways from like how his injury was described and, and how his timeout was described. So, um, so yeah, I think the Cole Turner signing is much more about the, the Richie Ryan injury and a lot less about, um, about Yuma's injury. Cause I do feel that Yuma um, or I get the, the sense anyways, that Yuma will be back um, shortly compared to compared to Richie. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of injury concerns and this, I mean, Christian, like this is feeling a little, like a little vintage locomotive. If we're being honest, like nothing like a good, nothing like a good injury bug, uh, for just to make locomotive fans, you know, feel nostalgic for the last couple of seasons. Yeah, and that's just, like I was saying, there's just so much going on that's so familiar that um, has caused us trouble, uh, you know, in the last couple of seasons. And so just seeing it again is is just what makes at least me a little bit more on edge about every every little thing that might go wrong. I, I just feel like I need to react that much heavier, too, because we've been here before, and like I said, we... We have had good endings two seasons, but heartbreaking nonetheless. And so if we can avoid being like those last two seasons uh, in all the negative ways, that would be perfect. Um, we, also, we also had questions, and this is a little bit more generally from, um, from at Fernie Elias on, on Twitter. He put together quite a lot uh, of stats around 
uh, attacking output over the last couple of seasons and, and um, was taking a look at, at shots created and, and all of these things. The bottom line is, is he came down and, and asked a question with all of the stats that, that suggest that the offensive production is, is higher than it is in previous season. Um, do you think the increased production is a result of Mark fine, t- fine tuning the roster year after year? And if we were to keep growing such production can, or will it affect the heavy possession style that we play or will at some point, like there be a tipping point where we have to play faster if we want to keep producing at higher and higher levels in terms of shots or, or expected goals or, or any of those sorts of things right now, we're creating goals at a a rate of just over one and a half per match. Um, So what do you guys think? I mean, I know, I know I kind of think it's, it's down to personnel a little bit. Um, but, but what do you guys think about, um, our increased production this year? I think it's down to personnel a lot of it, actually. <laughs> um, I, I don't think a, a lot of how we play is fundamentally changed. I think we've just brought in higher quality players that can execute that on a more regular, um, higher quality level. Um, and you know, to be fair, we do have some players that, can do things just individual brilliance. I mean, mm-hmm. Lucha Solignac, probably the best player I've ever seen in a locomotive shirt, just in terms of technique and um, ability and confidence. Diego Luna, of course, star boy, need I say more. Sebastian Velasquez, I mean, aging like fine wine. He's become much more of a team player while still retaining those 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 attributes that make him so dynamic and, and exciting to watch. So, yeah, I think it's just really, for me, a lot about it as personnel. I don't know that we'll sacrifice too much about the way that we play. Um, I think we'll just try to find more pieces that can make the way we play that much more attacking and efficient and, and, and quicker, honestly, because I think it was fine in Season 1 and Season 2. It was just a bit pedestrian at times, but with some of the new players we have, it's it's gotten a lot more entertaining and, and fruitful to watch. I think 1.5 per game, that's pretty good i would say um so yeah that's kind of my take on it yeah i I think as long as mark is here i don't think that possession heavy style is going anywhere so it's just a matter um like mika said of just bringing in better players year after year to to just get a better output from that same system yeah i mean i i've i think about that um in terms of you know thinking about differences year over year, I feel like the, I feel like the Diego goal in Austin, you know, whatever last week, whenever that was, (laughs) whenever these games are played, um, (laughs) like that goal combining with Seba and that's just not the type of goal that we score in previous seasons, like a shot from outside the box with a, a like this quick kind of one, two combination. Um, first time shot from distance, all that stuff. It's just not the type of goal that we score previously. And I think like that is indicative of the quality level being raised, you know, at each position and ultimately that leading to a lower percentage strike uh going in where previously i mean we just didn't score that much from outside of like (laughs) the six yard box practically like we scored a lot of really high percentage goals which is good because we were creating them but they're very hard to create consistently so um so yeah i think it's just i think it's just indicative of the fact that we have players who are capable of converting lower percentage chances um because they're just really good um so yeah i think and yeah just to reiterate what christian said i don't think we see that style change at all i think we just see better and better players executing it um so that brings us speaking of diego luna that brings us to the final question of the night from eric bauer at ebow 27 on twitter he said we all know that Luna will move on eventually, which, you know, debatable. We'll see. Locomotive legend for life. Um, <laughs> if you could decide which European league he would go to, which one would you pick and why? 
I know Christian's about to be like, he's not going to Europe. He's going to League MX. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they need as much help in the attack as they can get. Uh, Bravos need as much help in the attack as they can. I think he, I think he deserves a little bit better. Uh, to cross the fucking bridge every morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I'm mean, interested though, Christian. Do you have like, do you have a shout like where in Europe you might want to see him play now that because you've really come on in leaps and bounds in your European football knowledge. Real over talk. The years. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I I was gonna say I think Italy would be a nice shout. I think that there have been some. Uh, I think um, the Americans that have gone there have gone well. You have uh, McKinney. Um, I'm missing one. Lucio. No, yeah. Um, and so I, I think I, I don't follow uh, Serie A very closely, but I, I do follow now um, because I, I am partial to, to the Mexicans and, and Lozano does well for himself there. So... Um, there, Z- Zielinski does a does a pretty does a pretty good job over there, but uh, I think that G- I'd like to see him from one shade of blue to another. <laughs> and Napoli, wow, Diego yeah. Maradona Luna. <laughs> hey, <laughs> at Napoli, and he's got like the Maradona hair. He, yeah, he fits the mold. I love that shout. <laughs> <laughs> Mika, what do, what do you think? Well, yeah, City A is a great shout just because I think, um, re, you know, it's a myth that that in Italy they still play Catenaccio. It's actually the highest scoring league on average in the top yeah. five. And so um, creative players can really do a lot of damage in Italy. I like that. Um, I think that, with Luna's technical grounding in the game and his his heritage as a, a Barca residency academy product, I think a natural step for him would be, uh, you know, a step for him somewhere down his career, maybe not from us, but would be La Liga. Um, you know, it's a bit slower. It's it almost kind of like USL Championship in a way. I mean, uh, slower, tactical. Um, yeah, I think with the footballing like education that he has, it he he would fit in in, in a number of sides there. Um, obviously, he's an attacking midfielder that can also put it in a shift defensively and is central to a lot of uh, what his team does. And we see a lot of that in in Lely, or the the number ten is so so pivotal. Um, like I don't know, Nabi Fakir or um, Pedri to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, players like that. I think he could definitely be that that guy for for a Spanish side. And let's be honest, Barcelona will take whoever they can at this point. <laughs> they <laughs> He'd be need, their best player. <laughs> they need him. They need. Him. <laughs> Thank God they haven't they haven't come for him yet. Um, <laughs> oh my God, right? Diego Luna. We have an Ansu- option on him. <laughs> Diego Luna, Ansu Fati, just take over the world. Um, <laughs> I actually like if he went to La Liga, I I would say Sociedad, but that's just Ooh. La. Why Real. why 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 La Real? I like I look at Odegaard, like thriving mm. uh, in in that in that attacking midfield position, and I love the idea of him playing in a team that's like gotten used to playing with a ten. Like you said, like I just think of the teams that. Because there's so many teams in La Liga that play, you know, four three three, and it, it that's you know frequently what's used. So I'd be really interested to see him, you know, take on like a true like a true ten role and try to try to run things. Um, but I have a different shout because I think I think he has two choices, but I actually I'm torn a little bit. But I think. I think he he needs to take a step before he takes a step, if that makes sense. Like, you gotta oh call no, for you, Phil. ball. I think he needs. I I I would love. <laughs> call for you, ball. Not the Kanye. <laughs> not late. the Kanye. At, <laughs> it's eleven o three Eastern Standard Time, and you hit me with <laughs> fucking you, with Kanye in Paris. Lyrics. 
<laughs> watch the throne. Okay. So anyways, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> oh man, now I'm picturing Diego Luna playing for PSG and that's, <laughs> um, I, uh, no, I was going to say like, I think a couple of years ago, I would have said the Eredivisie, like bar okay. none. But I think now I, I will say Liga Nos. Ooh. Go to, we'll stop off in Portugal before he heads off to La Liga. Like get, get onto the Iberian Peninsula, but okay. with a stop <laughs> at, at Porto or Benfica. Um, maybe even sporting. I'm not ruling it out. But I just I love the idea of him like getting a chance to. I mean, play in a league where he's going to he's going to be like a choice, you know, I think I think it's just easy for guys to get lost, especially coming from USL. Like it could be it could be easy for someone to get lost in a system. Um, so the idea of, I, I just want like wherever he goes, I want him to stay a focal point so that, you know, he remains at the forefront of, of minds. Cause I think, I think like the way that the way that things have played out so far, regardless of what, of what takes place in Diego Luna's career from here on out, like the bottom line is he's made an impact at, for, at locomotive and we will all now follow like wherever he goes. Like, I'm not saying absolutely. that we'll root for those teams, but we will absolutely like follow his career because it, you know, it started here. It, it professionally like in earnest it began at locomotive so um i think we all just feel a little bit of ownership of like you know luna luna going and succeeding somewhere i think we all feel like a little shared responsibility and want to just want to see him do well wherever he goes i think a stop off in in portugal would be would be perfect before he ends up at you know whatever whatever you know super club spends the <laughs> the buku bucks to get him and I that's actually that, not that's like like unrealistic because Murano went from usl championship to to the ganosh to he, he, Pasos? Pasos? yeah yeah I mean, he hasn't played yet he hasn't yeah. played a minute there yet but yeah we'll see and that'll force you guys to uh to cut to keep a closer eye at league on your other pod <laughs> i feel like that i feel like they tend to fall by the wayside i know i know <laughs> Cause it's not too, it's not easy to watch Portuguese football like that. I don't know where they play it. I don't know. I'll have to look into it. There is yeah, like a legit, Fubo. is it? Okay. There yeah, is a legit Fubo. like three, three way title race shaping up in, in Liga Nos as well. Like obviously super early, but <laughs> Benfica sporting and, and uh, Porto are all separated Porto. by one point. So your Sociedad shout, shout wasn't bad. Consider they've obviously got eyes on USL because that's where um, the kid from Louisville's going too. Oh, that's right. Maybe that's what. So, maybe that's why I had that thought. I don't know. Maybe subconsciously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's actually really cool. So they've they've got eyes on the USL. Obviously, that is kind of crazy. I do think like with the I, you were talking the other day. Uh, about why um, Matthew Hoppe like ended up at Mallorca after Schalke, but we found out like there's like a little bit of a relationship um, with the academy that Hoppe like came through and Schalke yeah. and Mallorca. Yeah, because we <laughs> we actually had a. Uh, a player in that academy like reach out to us. Um, uh, he plays in the <laughs> Schalke Novia Residential Academy, and I was like looking into this, and it's a thing like Schalke and and Mallorca, and I think Eintracht Frankfurt are gonna sign up soon as well with this like academy system where they all kind of share resources and and bring American players over to um, those academies to just really immer immerse themselves in what a European you know, Academy is all about. And so, yeah, when I saw that Schalke and Mallorca both like run this thing, I was like, ah, okay. Like now it makes sense why Hoppy went to Mallorca. Cause it was kind of random. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So maybe that's a pipeline for, for young Diego. Yeah. Diego to, 
to Mallorca. That's not the worst place in the world to ply your trade. I mean, right? Mallorca is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Vacation destination for everybody else, but... Um, <laughs> But no, well, thanks to everyone who sent in questions. And uh, we we do this pretty much every time we record where we'll send out a tweet and ask for questions. So if you didn't get on this one, like just keep an eye out um, for um, us to, to tweet a, a questions tweet when we're recording. Um, and uh, yeah, you can have your question discussed on the pod. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone who, who sent those in. And uh, that does bring us to the end of the episode. If you've enjoyed it, um, please subscribe, follow, whatever, on your podcast platform of choice. And uh, give us a follow on Twitter, at Seriously Loco. Uh, keep an eye out this week for, or tomorrow, for uh, a giveaway from the Seriously Loco Twitter. Uh, four tickets to what is a deci- hopefully a decisive match in the Copa Tejas and playoff races for Locomotive. So um, keep an eye out for, uh, for any rules around that giveaway. And uh, aside from that, um, hopefully Locomotive getting a big result uh, on a Wednesday night against San Antonio will be tuned in um, and, uh, and seriously, Loco will be represented in the ground. Um, so, we will, uh, yeah, we'll be watching with uh, hopes and, and dreams uh, resting on, on this side. But um, until then, uh, everybody uh, enjoy and stay local. Yeah.